When you're going through troubles, tri tribulations, and you don't understand, the words say, just trust in Jesus. He Amen. understands. Amen. He understands. Amen. I just want to thank the church for all the prayers that have been going up and continue to go up on my behalf. Uh, mm -hmm. I find myself out there on an island um, of of necessarily, or not necessarily by myself, uh, in regards to uh, condition that I am going through right now. You know, oftentimes what I mean by that is uh, so often in this church, in many churches, uh, I've been uh, 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 attending, prayer requests would go up and they would more or less say, uh, uh, I, I, I have to go for and a biopsy. I have to go for some, you know, for uh, prognosis. And then the next week they come back with a praise report. Oh God, it didn't happen. And God, oh God, it was okay. When I stand on the other side, I went. And truth being told, I was diagnosed with a very rare. Rare, so rare, only a thousand cases have ever been reported worldwide in history. A tumor, neuroblastoma tumor in my nasal passage. And while they assured me that they've taken it out, but because it's so rare, they really don't know how to approach it. Surgeon assured me that he went in there some type of way with backwards incision and stuff, whatever, and he took it out. But then he said, well, mate, but you might want to go see a radiologist. So he sent me to a radiologist, and um, he said, well, we can do uh, radiation on you, and they shoot me every day for 10 minutes with eight shots, 30 second shots of laser beams of radiation everywhere, all through here. But then he said, well, you know, uh, maybe you need to go see an oncologist. You know, that's but I go that's see that's an oncologist, oncologist and she said, well, maybe because, you know, she, she said, I really am not familiar with this type of a tumor. I, you know, I don't have a whole lot of information. And uh, so I uh, 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 consulted with my colleagues. I consulted with 10 of my colleagues. And um, she said, out of the 10, three of them were remotely familiar with it. And they said that because it was attached to your brains, maybe you should do chemo. So I got surgery, radiation, and chemo. And this is what's going on with me. And, um, and days I feel great, days I'm down in the dump. You know, but... Uh, God has assured me that everything is going to be okay. His strength is perfected in my weakness. He let me know that he would never leave me, no matter what I'm going through. That he's going to take me through it. I might be in the wilderness wandering right now, but he has perfected me for a ministry to come. Amen. And he has given me a beautiful wife who has been right there with me throughout all this. And I just wonder what would happen. Uh, why? Two years ago, I was downtown. It was getting a wrap, It was getting a wrap. And so I just praise God. And I don't want to, you know, I, I think it's, 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 it's worthwhile to share with my home church exactly what I'm going through. Yes, yes, yes. Amen. You know, and, 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 and I know that you guys have been praying and you yes, know, and this yes, is just so a prayer. Yes, 
the result of your prayers that I'm here today. Amen. You know, for sure. Amen. But many days uh, of the, you know, I don't even feel like getting out of the bed. You know, it's just that, you know, treacherous. Uh, pastor called me last night. You know, I'd rather get a call from Pastor than some serious. <laughs> pastor said, Brother well, dear, I just called him. To, you know, get the word from you. Uh, you gonna be knowing the horn tomorrow. <laughs> I said, Pastor, I'll be too knowing the I'll be too knowing So pray, pray, God. God. Pray to God. The Lord is able, and we know that. Yes, He's he is. Thank the Lord. He's able. So let's go before the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father. Creator of all things, in your hand, Father God, do we stand or fall, Lord. You are an awesome God, a loving God, a kind God, Father God, that is interested in the very minutest details of our lives. And Father, I'm just grateful to glorify you in this manner, Lord, knowing that you have something greater and bigger and more amazing in my life, Lord. And I, I just pray this morning, Father God, that you would pour out your spirit here, Father God, over this church, over this great congregation, Lord God, and they would understand your truth as it flows from my lip. And Father, I just ask that your, 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 your Holy Spirit would superintend the time that we have here, that he would communicate your great truth, Lord. And, uh, just work in the hearts and minds of every person here and bless them with your great truth. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 My life is in ruins. My life is hell. It's hell. My whole life is over. Those were the words a young Audrey Potter, a teenage girl, posted those words on the internet. Okay. Posted those words on the, the internet over the Labor Day weekend. She said, my life is ruined. It's hell. My life is over. What had happened was she and a few 15-year-old kids had gotten together and they had a sleepover over mutual friends' house. And conveniently, the parents were away and they found the liquor cabinet, which wasn't locked. And young Audrey, she drank too much. In fact, she drunk herself into oblivion. She awakened the next morning, realizing something not too good had happened. Yeah. Later that week, she saw for the first time pictures that were being floated around the internet of her naked being sexually assaulted and according to reports, being humiliated. And mind you, this reportedly popular, successful teenage student was suddenly overwhelmed with failure and humiliation. A few days later, 9, 10, 12, Audrey committed suicide. Oh, yeah. My life is ruined. My life is hell. My life is over. Can I ask you a question this morning? How do you handle failure? I, I, I didn't say how, how, how do you handle, you know, the drink or how you would handle a situation like that. I said, how do you handle failure? When you fall, what do you do about it? How do you deal with it? It could be a financial failure, a relational failure. It could be an academic failure. Uh, how do you handle failure? See, everyone makes mistakes. Right. Everyone do stupid stuff. Yeah. Every, everyone do things that they don't want nobody else to know about. Amen. So how do you deal with failures and humiliation? I want to make a profound statement here. The way you deal with a failure determines the level of success you will attain to. Amen. The way you deal with failure, because failures are inevitable. 
but the way you deal with it will determine your level of success. It's a sad thing that Audrey didn't know or couldn't comprehend that God could have restored her. Oh yeah. Can I say to you this morning, your failures of the past don't have to define you in the future. The things that you have done in the past do not have to define who you are and what you do in the future. So oftentimes, folks in the church, they fail, they commit a sin, and as a result, they are sitting on the sideline like a, a, a church house mouse afraid to open their mouth, afraid to get involved, afraid because of their sin they committed in the past. All right. But you don't have to allow your, your failures of the past uh -huh. to dictate your future. That's right. That's right. We're going to take a look at God's word and ask the question, and this is the title of this message. What if I can get a new start? <laughs> what if I can get a new start? And the word of God say you can. God's word say you can get a new start. Our text is Proverbs 24, 16. It says, for though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. But the wicked are brought down by their calamity. Mm -hmm. Now notice, the number seven in Hebrew has several different meanings depending on the context. Mm -hmm. so you know you have to determine uh, the word's meaning by the context. Okay, so seven, determine uh, by uh, what it means by its context. Uh, so it could mean perfect. It could mean complete, or it could mean infinity. Infinity. Here it means infinity, having no end. Amen. So what the what, 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 what the proverb is saying that a righteous man fall an indefinite number of times yeah. and he rise again. Yes, yes sir. Yes, he does. And yeah. A, 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 a righteous man fall an indefinite number of times, but he rises again. See, the difference between a righteous man and the wicked is not that uh, they don't uh, uh, fall. It's, it's not that they don't fall. They, we both fall. The difference is what separates the righteous from the ungodly is what you, what you do after you fall. What you do after you fall. That's the difference. And we find this principle throughout throughout scripture. <clears throat> Take for instance Judas and Peter. Leading up to the crucifixion, Peter and Judas let their Lord down. They both failed him and they both felt bad. Peter cursed and swore vehemently. No, I don't know that man. Don't try to put me with that man. I don't know him. With curse words. Yeah. More curse probably than, than a sailor would spew out his mouth. He swore he didn't know Jesus. Judas and, 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 and both of them felt bad, bad. Both of them felt guilty. Judas tried to give back the 30 pieces of silver stricken by grief. In my opinion, one was as bad as the other. They both did wrong. They both did bad by their Lord. However, Judas, Judas figured it was no use. He figured he had blown it too bad. So he goes out and hang himself. He figured it was over. But Peter, on the other hand, he cried out to God. He said, Lord, have mercy on me. I have sinned against you. He confessed his sins. And two months later, we find a, a, a Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost where 3,000 souls are saved. We find where Peter wrote two books in the New Testament and narrated one of the Gospels, Mark. He went on to become 
a pillar in the church, a leader. They both fell. They both fell bad. But one rose up and the other bumped out. <laughs> Many other Bible characters could be given. I think about Moses. How terribly he fell on his first escapade out. He knew that God had given him a ministry to do. But he totally blew it. Moses murdered a man. Thinking that he was doing the work of God. And he was banished to the backside of the Sinai Peninsula. And it was there that God began to work with him. Somebody said that uh, for 40 years, Moses thought he was a somebody. And for 40 years, God showed him he was a nobody. And then another 40 years, God showed him what he could do with a nobody. All right. All right now. Sorry. He called his attention and do some things with it. And turn his life around. And, and, and get him in the spirit. See, Moses trying to work, operate in the flesh. Uh -huh. uh -huh. God him to be operated, be spiritually minded. Uh -huh. yeah. And once he became spiritually minded, he went on and did what God wanted him to do. Amen. Then I think about uh, Elijah in the Old Testament. Went up against the great Jezebel. Uh -huh. Jezebel is so uh -huh. evil. Now, if you find somebody named their daughter uh, uh, Jezebel, uh, somebody, uh, there's something wrong with her. She, she is so evil. She was so evil. Eating, take care of that evil that it reverberates down through the age to now. Oh, nobody, I know of nobody named Jezebel. But Elijah went up against this wicked queen, Jezebel. Took out her, her prophets, 940 of them. Took them out. But then Jezebel, she stood up and said, By this time tomorrow, Elijah, you're going to be dust. You're going to be dust meat. Elijah took off running. Now he forgot all about what God did with him. He going to sit down on the juniper tree and say, Lord, just kill me. I'm so mad. I'm so depressed. My life is over. Just kill me. Listen at what God had done, he done forgot all about that. But then God intervened. And he said, he visited him in a still small voice. And he let him know that I'm not through, I'm not done with you yet. That is, I'm getting ready for you to anoint a couple of other kings, and you need to, 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 to raise up another prophet named Elijah. And so he came back to his senses. And then we think about Rahab the harlot. Her daily occupation was that of prostitution. That's what she did on a daily basis. She sinned greatly outside of the things that we would call godly. However, however, some type of way, somehow, she came into the people of God and she understood the things of God. And she confessed and forsake that lifestyle. And we find Rahab the harlot in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Then you come on down to the times we think about David. And his gross sins of adultery and murder with Bathsheba and Uriah. David, man after God's own heart, man who God hung his hat on, if you will, gave him his approval. But this man of God failed. He committed sin. He committed adultery. Uh -huh. He murdered somebody. But he confessed that sin and forsaken that sin. And God restored him. So I want to say to you this morning, church, whoever you might be that have failed the Lord, have failed the church, have sinned grossly, God said you can be restored. God said, I'm going to restore 
to you. I want to give you another chance. Glory to God. He want to give you another chance. So, no one is without failure. So, no matter who you are in his house this morning, you can come down off that high horse. You can come on down here with us. Because you can fail. You have failed. And that ain't no, no joke. Because we got the scoop on you. But the question is, what do you do with failure? What do you do with it? Question is, what could I, what if I could get me a new start? New start. Proverbs 24, 16 says, Though a righteous man fall seven times, he rises again. Now, I want to just uh, examine four reasons, four causes basically to failure. Four causes, there are four basic causes to failure. Number one, will for sin. Will for sin. You know, that's right. Like, like, like the Nike commercial, just do it. Yeah. Feel good, just do it. Right. Sometimes sin just feel good. You know, you, you say, I just want to just reach over there and just smack that person there. there. I just want to do it. The other day, I, I was going down the freeway and this guy cut me and my wife off. Well, he almost hit us. My hand was coming up. Well, I wanted to oh. go that. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord <laughs> of his law. Right. And when you violate God's law, you can be sure you are going to get in trouble. Without right. a doubt, you're going to get in right. trouble. Right. The Bible says the ways of sin is death. Yeah. Now some people say, every time that you sin, something dies. They say when you sin, a seed dies. Sales die. Plans die. Relationships die. Whenever you sin, something in your life dies. Amen. Now, I don't, you know, I don't buy into that because I don't see it in the Bible, but that's what some people say. Yeah. But now, the true or false, I don't know. But you can bank on this right here. One true thing right here. You can be sure your sin will find you out. You don't get away from it. Well, it was fun or not, it's going to get you. You might have felt good, but it's going to get you. <laughs> I don't doubt about it. So the second reason, so, so the first reason is a willful sin. The second reason folks fail is unwise decisions. Oh, Making yeah. decisions without thinking the situation through. Now this is on me. I, uh, when I was at this church, and please listen to me carefully, a uh, young minister here uh, has just started sharing in the word probably about seven, eight years ago. And uh, I've shared uh, the pulpit with Pastor Jackson, and I think I've been just me and her. But uh, every time, and we, my wife, she had a youth minister here, and so we come over on the weekend, and we have went Thursday and Friday. Mm -hmm. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We'd be here Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Yeah. And every time I would walk in the door on Saturday, I was bombarded by church people. Oh, Brother Jim, you got to do something about this right here. This is going on. This is going on. Brother Jerry, you got to do something. You, you're the closest to the pastor. You're a Christian in the pool. And you, you just got to do something about this right here. And, you know, for me, I, I don't like confrontation. <laughs> and I really I don't, so I'm trying to just ignore it for a moment. For it. But then every, I mean, every time I came here, the same thing. Oh, Brother Jerry, you got to do something. Uh, I'm talking about church leaders. I'm talking about uh, choir leaders. I'm talking about people here in the church. Some of you uh, might be here now. I ain't calling on them. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. Oh, and the thing of the matter is, I was a young, yeah. dumb minister cutting my teeth on the word, and I made an unwise decision. Okay. I made a very unwise decision uh, in that, whether it was true or not, I didn't have restoration in mind. I didn't, I, yeah, what I had yeah, in mind yeah. was uh, condemnation. Uh -huh. You know, I, I, I talked to the pastor about it. She probably remembered it. She might as well talk about it. But 
<laughs> and I, I talked to the pastor about this. I mean, they got to be cut off. You got to be cut off. You got to be cut off. You got to be church and this and that and this and that. Pastor Brother Jeremy, this is you. Maybe you ain't got the whole picture. We got to be, we got to put love in this right We got to, we got to have mercy. Yeah. Yeah. I know I'm not going to say this. I don't know why I made that decision. That's what God's coming true. Yeah. 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 Come on now. Based on what other people are telling me. Yeah. 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 You know, I just want to be walked into a landmine. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
First of all, they deny him. You know, they deny they sin. I mean, they'll be crumbed all around their mouth and then deny that they ain't cooking. You know, they say, I didn't do that. I didn't do nothing wrong. I didn't get caught at least. Right. Many of us get that politician syndrome. You know, where if you get caught, you just, just, just deny it and deny it and deny it. Then they get overwhelming evidence against you. That's when you beg for mercy. <laughs> so we deny our circumstances. We we deny that we have failed. We deny that we have sinned. Some Christian folk they hide behind cliches. You know, they know that they have failed. Yet they walk around and say, "I'm blessed by the best. I'm God's favorite." You know, bragging that sin. Best part of us. Drag. <laughs> God's favorite. And that yes. sin oh is right there with them. Now, there are times when we are God's but not with sin. Right. Right. There are times when we should be saying, I'm blessed by the best. Second one is excuses. Excuses is playing the blame game. But I fail because my mama, you know, dropped me when I was two years old. <laughs> I fail because of my race. Uh -huh. It's hard for a black man. Yeah. Oh, I fail because of, of my background. Uh -huh. I used to use heroin. <laughs> that, that causes me to sin every now and then. <laughs> and we use the script. Oh, we flip the script and we say, well, I deserve a break today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tell the truth. What I did, what I did worked that bad. Yeah, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't that bad. Yeah, it was bad enough to cause a failure. Uh, the third thing we do, we deny, we excuse, mm -hmm. then we try to escape. Uh, escape. Some folks find it easier to escape their problem than to deal with it. Uh, now, I was a resident of Skid Row for about 12 years. And down on Skid Row, I met all kinds of people, doctors, lawyers, oh I met teachers and pastors, I, I met uh. church leaders, all kinds of people Whoa. down on Skid Row. Uh. And all of them had some type of a failure. Yeah. But rather than deal with their failure, they would escape into the sauce. Uh. They would escape into the drugs or alcohol. Uh. They would, you know, uh, be, rather than deal with their problems, they would run from it and get tore up every night on some mood altering chemical. And some take the, you know, the ultimate uh, plunge and commit suicide. Some folks take the escape route of entertainment. You ever see some folks, everywhere they go, they got something plugged into their ears or the eyes are glued to the TV. Uh -oh. They cannot go an hour without listening or having something in their ears or in front of the TV. No they are afraid to be alone with themselves with God. Uh -huh. They're scared of who they are or who they might find themselves out to be. Uh -huh. So they escape through entertainment. Uh -huh. Number four, the fourth way you can deal with failure you can restore. You can restore. And that's the way I recommend. Yeah. To admit your failures and get a new start. All right. I would encourage the church this morning to restore, to admit your failures, own your baggage, claim your mess, uh, and get a new start. Amen. And not only that, I have failed. Yeah. It wasn't the pastor. Uh, it wasn't my husband. Yeah. I have failed. I, I have failed. Yeah. This is my baggage. I'm claiming my baggage and I am going to confess it to God. And I would encourage you to do that this morning. Whoever you might be who feel like you are lesser than and that folks are looking down at you and that your ministry is not flowing the way you would like for it to flow. Chances are you have unconfessed sin in your life. Amen. And so you need to confess your sins own up to your mistakes and allow God to restore you. 
Get off the sideline. Get back in the mainstream. Amen. That's it. But that's what God wants you to do. That's right. He wants you to, He wants to restore you. Amen. Proverbs 24, 16 says, Though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. So, I don't look at John the eighth chapter. And this is perfect. John the eighth chapter, uh -huh. verses three through eleven. And here, Jesus had just come down out of the mountain. And uh, he's in the synagogue and he's teaching the congregation. And while he's in the midst of teaching, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees bring to him a woman caught in the very act, yeah, yeah, yeah. in the very act of adultery. Now, now that, had, that had always puzzled me because how did they catch her in the act? It was, and the other one is, you know, why is the man? You know, right, yeah. it yeah. takes two to tango. Come on now, preach. But the, 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 the truth being told, according to the scripture, they, was they, called, on her. they brought her and stood her before Jesus. Yeah. And they said, according to the law of Moses, yeah. we are to stone this woman, mm -hmm. such women as these, mm -hmm. that have been caught in adultery. What do you say, Master? <laughs> yeah. They were trying to trap in the Bible section. Yeah. Jesus bit down the ground. Is that right? Uh, yes, he did. He rolled on the ground like this. Yeah. Uh, a few minutes there. Then I guess they got impatient. They said, Master, yes, what do you say, do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Jesus pulled himself up to his full six feet. Look at him. All right. I looked around at all of You who without uh, uh, sin cast the first stone. Yeah. Jesus went back over there and went to write again. <laughs> <laughs> He went to right. And the Bible say, yeah. they began to break cap. Uh -oh. The Bible say, Jesus cleared the church that morning. Uh -huh. The Bible say, starting with the, the youngest to the oldest, uh -huh. they all left. Uh -huh. Not only the Pharisees and the teachers, but everybody in the church everybody. left. Everybody in the church was, was full of sin. Uh -huh. yeah. That sin. Yeah. The Bible say, they all left. Uh -huh. And when Jesus stood up, all somebody there standing before him was the woman called in adultery. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and the three lessons you want to learn from that. <laughs> First of all, verse 7, all have sinned. Uh -huh. Every person who has ever lived and continues to live sinned. There's none righteous, no, not one. Not one. Together, the whole human race have gone astray, the Bible says. Yeah. The poison of Acts is under our look. That's none righteous. No, not one. And we find that, but Jesus said, he who is without sin, he all has yeah. sins, so they're left. The Bible say, say everybody sins. Everybody sins. Amen. Verse 10. Jesus don't condemn anyone. No matter who you are, what you've done, no matter if you've been downtown or skip for 20 years, you smoke up all the drugs in Peru. Jesus do not condemn you. He don't condemn you. The woman who, the woman, who are they who condemn you? No one master, she said in verse 10. Jesus said, neither do I. I don't condemn you. Jesus did not have a ministry of condemnation, but a ministry of restoration. John 3.17 says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus want to save you out of your mess, not condemn you. Amen. So, so you might feel condemned, but it's not Jesus. A church might condemn you, but not Jesus. You know, uh, your family members might condemn you, but not Jesus. Jesus do not condemn you. Third statement we find in verse 11. He said, leave your life of sin. Leave your life of sin. So notice Jesus, he didn't just sugarcoat the matter. 
He didn't just pat on the hand and say, Grandpa's going to make it all right. You know, you, you did wrong. Don't worry about it. That's not what he did. He didn't overlook her sins. He gave her the hard work of changing. He said, you ought to change your life. Leave that lifestyle. Repent of that lifestyle. Leave your life of sin. See, Jesus loves us as we are, but he loves us too much to leave us the way that we are. So we need to learn how to overcome temptation and failure. We need to learn how to overcome temptation and failure. You know, or maybe just stay there. Can I say to you this morning, while it's better not to fall, it sure is. It's better not to fall. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But if you do fall, you yeah. can be raised up again. Yeah. And in the same manner, it's best not to get a broke leg. Yeah. It's better not to get a broke leg. Yeah. Right. A broke leg right. can be repaired. That's right. You know, so it's better not to get those things. Yeah. So I want to give you five steps real quickly here. Five steps on how to have that new life. So first of all, confess your sins and failure. Now that's a difficult thing to do. I know it is. You know, we don't like to, we don't like to confess your faults to one another. We don't want to confess our faults to one another, and we don't want to confess to God either. We'd rather cover them up. We got to act like it we didn't do it. You know, ain't doing just that. whatever the case might be. But to confess basically means to agree with God uh -huh. that you did something that was right. Amen. <laughs> confess your sins to God and don't try to cover up. Some of us remember the penitentiary Psalms of David, 32, 51, and quite a few others. It's called penitentiary because it's about repentance. Okay. David, after he had this escapade with Bathsheba, <laughs> And, uh, and Uriah actually took Nathan <laughs> to bring him to his senses. He confessed his sins and he wrote Psalms uh, uh, 50, uh, 32. Psalm 32. And this is what he had to say. He said, Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him and whose sin, whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, and that is when he kept silent about his sin, not confessing his sin, my bones wasted away from my groaning all day long. But day and night your hand were heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer, Selah. Then I acknowledged my sins to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sins. Yes. I'm convinced that much of the emotional yes. trauma, much of the, um, the hurt, the pain, the, much of the, the anxiety in the church, in the Christian life, has to do with unconfessed sin. Amen. David said his bones were broken. Woo. He said that he was hurting. <laughs> And the thing of the matter is, unless we confess these sins, God is going to pester you. He's going to mess with you. There ain't no doubt about it. But we understand that sin is difficult to confess. In fact, the pastor was telling, talking uh, to his congregation one day, and he, and he let them know, he said, I, I really don't want to cause more confusion in the church. But the other day, I seen, uh, I seen a very prominent member of our church going to a hotel room uh, with a, a woman that was his wife. And rather than, you know, just making a, this ugly scene and, and, and confession and, and, and all this thing right here, next Sunday, I want you, if you're in agreement with me, that you want to confess to that sin, I want you to put a $100 bill in the collection plate. He said next Sunday, $10 to $100 bill. <laughs> 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 you know, so many people, are in sin. And they don't want to confess it. So they just felt like, you know, well, I put a hundred dollar bill in there, that'll take care. You can't buy our way out of sin. You can't buy your way out of it. You can't pay God. They call for confession. Confession of our sin. And it goes beyond forgiveness. Psalm 51 
say, uh, Psalm 51, 4 and 10, it says, against you, you only have I said and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Create in me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. See, we need to have more than forgiveness. We need restoration. We need a pure heart. Some folks just want to get cleaned up so they can go back out there and do it again. But we need a pure heart, a clean heart. But in order for, the, for, for this to happen, we have to give it to God. We have to give our heart to God. Amen. Stories told about a young college kid. Let me tell these stories a little bit. That uh, went off to college the first year and uh, he hadn't washed his clothes for about three or four months. He wore the same clothes because he was ashamed to go into the you know, to do it with his, his laundry. Mm. You know, so he finally go to the laundry room, you know, he had took all his clothes and bundled them up in a big old sweatshirt. You know, he looked around and man, all these people they ain't gonna see my dirty clothes. I've been wearing these clothes. So what four or five times each probably. And so he took all those clothes, he said, what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna wash it. And he put the money in there and he that whole bundle of clothes, he put them in the washer. <laughs> <laughs> they washed them. He washed the clothes. You know, and then he took them out after the washing it dry. I mean after washing it done, he took the clothes and uh, he put them in the dryer. <laughs> the whole put the sun in the dryer and 30 minutes later they dry. So he takes his clothes, he takes one. Three things happen with them clothes. He opened them up. First of all, they had got wet. Yeah. Second of all, they had got dry. Third of all, they were still dirty. Yeah. And they go be dirty. Uh -huh. And until you give your heart to God, uh -huh. uncover it, uh -huh. it's going to remain dirty. Uh -huh. God want to do a cleansing, purifying work in your life. Yeah. But he can't do it if uh -huh. you keep that heart covered up. If you, keep, uh -huh. you, know, if you bundle sin up in your heart and don't allow him to get there. Come on now. Because yeah, God, he, he want to do more than forgive you. Mm -hmm. He also want to restore you. Yes, and yes. restoration comes from a clean heart. Yes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Right. Amen. Mm -hmm. So, first, so the, so the next thing we want to do is receive God's grace. Mm -hmm. After you have confessed your sins, you need to, we need to receive God's grace. Amen. His grace and forgiveness. Receive it. Just like we receive anything from God, we need to receive His grace. The woman caught her induction. She didn't cower away from Jesus. She went to Him. You know, Jesus is able to restore us. He paid an exorbitant price for our sins. First John 1 John 1.7 says, In the blood of Jesus, there's power in the blood of yes. Jesus. Yes. That blood is able to purify yes. and able to forgive. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us of all unrighteousness. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sin. In other words, Jesus it's the infinite God who paid an infinite price for our sins. So there's no sin outside of his blood. And his blood won't cover. I was uh, 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 sharing the gospel with a guy, pretty big size guy, and um, and I was telling him about how God loved him and how God wanted to forgive him, but he's, he let me know that ain't no way he could be forgiven. All the things that he had done, and then you read the stuff that he may not well, nowhere near what I had done. So, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, he was just—he could not see in his mind that God could forgive him of something right. like that. Mm -hmm. And then I took him to, to the scripture, and I read uh, for him First Corinthians six nine and eleven, where it says, "Do not do do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither sexual, immoral, nor idolatrous, nor uh, adulterous, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkard, nor the slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. Some of you were like that. The church has to fill with excess. But God has washed us. He has regenerated us. He has changed our life and given us a new start in life. He's given us a new identity. 
And once I showed him that, then he was more apt and acceptable to the word of God. Amen. Amen. You were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of God. So our forgiveness and cleansing is not based on who we are or what we are not. It's based Amen. on the infinite blood of Jesus. Amen. A blood that can cover every sin. There's no sin beyond his capabilities. So the third thing we need to do is we need to start growing. We need to grow. You know, you need you just need to grow. We grow by getting into the word. You grow by getting involved in ministry. I just look at these chairs here. Right. There's much ministry to be done. Yes, There's man. much discipleship to be done. There's much evangelism to be done. Yes, these are the things that rewards you. You know, uh, as Pastor was talking about television, you know, uh, fast TV for a couple of days a week, and go out on the street and, and win some souls for the Lord. Yes. Let that be a ministry to you. Amen. God will honor your efforts and He will bless your life. These are things to help us pick, to pick up and remove away from our failures. Uh, Romans 12, 2, 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. I, I, three, I got three students in here. They know that verse right there. Yeah. 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 That word transformation right there uh, is, is a Greek word that means metamorphosis. That God want to do a metamorphosis. He want to change your life. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he changes us as we give ourselves to him. Yeah. As we cast ourselves on him. That's right. Through prayer, through study of the word, and so forth and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, move on. So the fourth thing is set safe boundaries against temptation. Alcoholics stay away from bars. Set safe boundaries. Now, women who are weak for a man get a support group. Accountability. Um, Folks who have weight problems, perhaps they need to get set a, a diet for boundaries. Anyway, wherever we have to draw a line in the sand and say, I go this far and no more. That's far as I'm going. Yeah. Amen. Scripture say, do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of the evil men. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn from it. Go your own way. Own way. And that's what we need to do. When it's in regards to whatever made us feel, be it alcohol, drugs, be it sex. We had to set up safe boundaries. Say it. We have to. Come on now. You've heard that it was said, Matthew 5, 27, 29. Do not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If you're right, I call to you to say, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better to lose, better for you to lose your uh, one part of your body than for you. But then for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Now, what Jesus said, is he saying gouge your eye out? Is that what he means? No, he's talking about the seriousness of sin. He's saying basically, if you if you got uh, a computer and you can't stay off that computer and he kind of calls you to go to these porn sites, he's saying take it and throw it out the window. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Whatever it is that called you to sin, get rid of it. Rid of it. Throw that off. Break it off. Yeah. Don't play around with it. Get serious about this thing. Yeah. That's what he is saying. Then we need to set the boundary of prayer groups and accountability partners. We got problems in our life. We need to have prayer. Yeah. We need to have uh, 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 folks that we can call up at night and pray. Say, man, I'm struggling right now. I'm going through. I, I need you to pray for me. We need an accountability partner. We need a prayer group. Matthew 6, 13, it says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver deliver us from the evil one. And then that's on the time we just have to flee. Right. You know, if that bad, it's just, it's just, it's I'll be for about two years there, boy. When I went downtown Los Angeles, and that crack was calling me, I, I, was, I was out of there. 
I mean, I didn't even mess around. You know, and that's just the truth. So we have to set boundaries. In my marriage, I've been married 12 years by the grace of God. I knew that early on, if I was going to maintain a pure marriage, I need to do something with my eyes. And I read up on, 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 on Job, and Job said that uh, he, he had made a covenant with his eyes. And I said, look at that, it made the lust after her. So I had to start pra practicing bouncing my eyeballs. Amen. What, what, you know, whatever. But I bounce my eyeballs. I don't let my eyes feast on it. <laughs> so, That's right. That's, That's right. Of many things that you have to do sometimes. Amen. I've fallen and I can't get up. I'm going to help you up this morning. Wrong. As we Wrong. begin to close, the fifth thing that we want to do, first of all, you want to confess your sins and failures. Yes. First step in getting up. Confess your sins and failures. Receive God's grace and forgiveness. Begin to grow. Get involved in the ministry. Grow. Because if you're not moving ahead, you're moving back. If you stand still, if you stand still, you stand on a slippery slope. You know, so get involved in the ministry. You know, I'm just waiting for enough people to get ready over here for the equipment class, the uh, uh, discovery class. So we can train those classes back here. I mean, you got Wednesday night class, and you know, and I'm sure there's other classes uh, that are available here. Set safe boundaries. Yeah. And then number five is get help from godly people. Don't be too proud yeah. to ask for help. Get help. If it's going to keep you from falling, get help. Yeah. Reach out to some godly folks. Galatians uh, 6 1 say, Brother, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritually should restore him gently. I'm looking for the day, real, real soon, say soon. Brother Wyatt and Sister Understand, they're going to be graduating next, next week. And they know how to do small group ministry. I'm looking to help them start right here at harvest time. A men and a women's group ministry. They, 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 they have the capability, they went through the training, um, they're going to be certified, and they have the heart for it. Yes. And it's a need for ministry. It's a need for ministry. I look for the day that it actually takes place. And they will get all our support. Okay. Scripture say, Hebrew 10, 24, and 25 say, and let us. Consider how we may spur one another on together toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another daily. Church, my message is pretty much done. But what I want to say to you is this. Perhaps you've been sitting on the sidelines for years. You've been trapped by something somebody did, or you did, or somebody said. You've been robbed of what God has for you. You're being robbed of what God wants to do with your life. Maybe it's justifiable. Maybe you did sin. Maybe you did something wrong. I want to say to you today that through confession, of that sin by owning up to it, carry your own baggage to God, you can be restored. God will restore you. God has a place in this church for you. This church needs you. That's right. Yeah. This church is not what it should be without you. That's right. So whoever you are, thinking that you are in inconsequential, Whoever you are that's not willing to put forth uh, maximum effort to get up and get back involved in the church. I want, to know, I want you to know that God loves you. God loves you. He wants to restore you. He wants to give you back that place of where you are once in your life. I don't know. Uh, I believe that some of you 
my opinion. Um, touch by the word, you might feel like you need to um, be doing something, but you have not. You might feel like um, that the area of your life you you're not uh, you're not real sure about. It might be sin. It might be something else. But I want to open the altar and whatever the case might be. I want you to know that God can cleanse you and restore you and give you a new heart. I want you to know that God is not condemning you. He is not trying to put you on front street. He really wants to um, be used uh, well, he really wants to use you right. and want to work through you. So I'm getting ready to turn the pulpit over to Pastor McAdoo. And I just believe that some of you out there today are cheating yourself. A hand around baggage that's hindering you. It's weighing you down. And right now, you can be free of it. And you can be that person that God wants you to be. Amen? Amen. Amen.